If you think you've seen it all, you may have to reconsider, as this crazy story is about to take us to the most unbelievable places. We open on small town Billy. A young boy is so thirsty for the macabre that he stands at the curb in the early morning awaiting the most recent issue of the Creepshow periodical, lovingly delivered by the mystical pervert who handles such things. He wastes no time diving in and thumbing through its sordid pages filled with adult content. This leads us into our first story, set at Spruce's general store where Ray sings a strange song. As long as I'm drinking Jimmy's crack corn. <laughs> Mm, drinking what now? He jokes with his old friend who spent many an evening watching Ray masturbate in the parking lot. Because, as Martha points out, there's not much else to do in this dead town and with their business on a severe downward slope. But Ray is committed to devoting his entire essence to the store, what gave him everything he's ever had in life, even as the town sucks him dry of his retirement. Shortly after, Benjamin White Moon pulls up to their door with his posse. After cordial greetings, we discover Benny's here to provide some collateral for all the debt their tribe owes to Ray. His offering consists of the tribe's most precious belongings to be held in pawn. Filled with grace, Ray attempts to return the items. However, doing so would make them beggars rather than borrowers, an insult that could only be repaid with a messy and painful death. So an agreement is reached that even warms the icy cockles of Martha's cynical heart. But as soon as the proprietors return to the till, they find Benjamin Benjamin's nephew Sam White Moon and his gaggle of local shitheads have come in through the back. They proceed to help themselves to all the Bazooka Joe they can chew, along with some Diet Pepsi and for calorie management. They'd like more but are disappointed by the general lack of cash. They send Martha back to fetch her purse because they need money to take a one-way trip to Hollywood, where Sam intends to leverage his silky locks for fame, fortune, and women. Once he's drained them of all they have and is finished making his point about not being a loser he sends Kavanaugh out to get the car. Oh, and one more thing. He's aware of Ray's satchel of trinkets, which he values around $10,000. Martha's got a little sass in her. So in the midst of the confusion and struggle, a misfire puts her down slowly. Unremorseful about the fate of the White Devils, Sam takes out the only other unsympathetic witness. While Fatty's in the corner, puking his guts out. This is beyond the pale, but the trappings of the Hollywood lifestyle are too enticing to pass up. So he gets back on board. On their way out, Sam expresses excitement about finally getting out from under the burden of the old dust farm. There ain't no dust in Hollywood, man! Well, there must be some dust, right? Luckily, while they intend to be hasty, it's not an immediate trip. They all have time to go home and pack up their stuff. Meanwhile, back at the store, the magic of Chief Woodenhead takes hold and he slowly dons the war paint. Out at his trailer, having nothing of value, Fatty Gribben spends his extra time taking in a snack and a movie, and his distraction leads to a severe case of penetrative wounds. Andy Cavanaugh has a wealthy father and good prospects here in town, but he doesn't dare cross Sam. He hears a crashing noise coming from the garage, which is where he was going anyway, and finds his Firebird smashed up like a Street Fighter bonus level. We then watch in profile as he gets tomahawked in the face. The Chief's making quick work, but Sam is no easy target, and he manages to confront his foe head on. Despite his insistence that the statue is not alive, he still makes for an escape through the bathroom. The Chief compensates for his stiff movement by cutting an angle and pulling Sam through the wall by his hair. Uncle Ben wakes up the next morning with a little gory surprise in his bed. When he gets to Spruce's, the Chief is grasping the bloody scalp of his most beautiful victim. A just punishment, Benjamin presumes, and the Reconciler has returned to his formerly wooden state now that vengeance has been served. With every last detail taken care of, Ben departs satisfied and leaves the bodies to rot. Before getting to the next story, we're shown that Billy spent a month's worth of allowance on a Venus flytrap, which he awkwardly accepts from the postman. Then we catch up with some students of unknown age heading out to Cascade Beach to smoke some reefer on the lake's infamous raft. It's a highly sought-after amenity, but the late season should prevent them from finding any competition. And sure enough, when they rip up to the shore, there she blows. Despite it being mid-September, the idea of a four-way on some wooden slats is irresistible, so they all strip down and doggy paddle their way out. At about the halfway point, Randy notices some ducks having a little trouble. He pushes through and the boys make it aboard Sans genitals. Randy rushes Rachel up and they nearly pull Laverne's arm out of its socket as a sentient trash bag floats under their raft. The nature of this perceived oil slick is confounding, especially for Deke. I don't believe in oil slicks, man. I only believe in what I can smell and taste 
and touch. You can do all of that to an oil slick, my friend. Randy expresses some concern that no one knows that they're here, but Deke's handing out the joints and generally digging around, creating an atmosphere where it's hard to take anything too seriously. As a result, the mesmerizing patterns do their evolutionary job, drawing in its prey close enough to attack. Rachel dumps in so quickly that the others don't even realize what's happened. But that's all good, because she emerges long enough to confirm that she is, in fact, in tremendous pain before getting dragged under for good. Now feeling concerned, Deke compels Laverne to shut it while the boys plan. They don't actually have many options at this point, so the plan is to wait for now. Eventually, it begins to move back under the raft. Given its amorphous nature, Deke is certain he can outswim it and he believes this is the perfect time to just go for it, as any delay could result in the goo slipping betwixt the slats and actively digesting them in broad daylight. As we are now witnessing, Randy and Laverne watch in horror as he gets folded up and sucked through a hole for a finishing touch. Randy assesses the situation and determines that if they avoid the space between the boards, they'll be okay. They just have to not freak out about it, and they get their chance to reset as the creature feeling sluggish while digesting such a tough, sinewy meal, floats off to relax during the process. Randy and Laverne take turns sleeping and keep in watch, but eventually have to huddle together for warmth through the rest of the night. Randy wakes up first and hesitates for about 1.2 seconds before treating his friend like a sex doll. And since there is no justice, his actions ultimately result in Laverne getting her face melted off. He stands in an observational pose, so he may recount the details details of this story later as she is dragged into the water. With no other fodder, he uses this final digestion phase to try to get a head start cutting across the lake, but is horrified to see that she still hungers. Randy makes it to shore and, in his hubris, celebrates rather than creating distance. The algal mat blindly consumes him, relegating his fate to that of all other biological material it comes across, and fulfilling the circle of life. In our interim story, it's revealed that everyone in town knows Billy's got the coolest shit, so the bullies cut him off and teach him an important lesson about the consequences of having hobbies and interests. Luckily, the old reliable nutshot buys him the time he needs to escape. Then we transport to a much more adult setting, where Annie wakes up a little late. The clock always goes to 12 like this when the power Goes off. Imagine a time when that needed to be explained. She tosses the going rate for orgasms at her little whore before dipping out to get home on time in order to avoid suspicion from her husband, George. He is, after all, the provider of all of her nice things. The timing just isn't going to work out, so she racks her brain for an alibi. Then, the universe provides one for her when she ashes on her leg, loses control of her bends, and hits a hitchhiker on her way off the road. She thinks about checking on him, but he's all twisted up like a pretzel, and with headlights coming around the bend, she makes the decision that only one life need be ruined this evening. So she goes incognito and pulls a sloppy fishtail on her way out of there. Shortly thereafter, all sorts of motorists roll up to insert themselves into the tragedy, hoping they may be able to milk the experience for sympathy later. Annie goes blowing down the road trying to rationalize her actions. I mean, why mess things up for herself over an honest accident? Yeah, that's the ticket. She'll let it settle in a bit and see if she can handle it. If it becomes too heavy, she'll turn herself in. That is the perfect point to focus for a catastrophe that has befallen someone other than yourself. But it ends up appearing all good, as when she stops for the first time, she sees the kindly gentleman approaching her from the rear. As we come to find out, he just really wanted to take a moment to thank her for the ride. Even fleeing in short bursts won't deter him. It's a driving motivation that keeps him creeping about and holding on tight no matter what what occurs. She even takes a wooded drive in the moonlight in a desperate attempt to shake his unbreakable grip. Only when she finds a perfectly placed log to go underneath does he finally get scraped off. Then, as is her pattern, she takes a little rest not far from the scene. She then reaches into her glove box to withdraw her pistol. So, when he again expresses his boundless gratitude, she turns his battered face into an even bloodier, pulpier mess before driving back and forth along the roadway and smearing his ass all over the pavement. So, I guess we're going to assume that she can live with the guilt. The only problem, though, is that she has evidence absolutely dripping off of her. Despite leaving him gurgling on the ground behind her, he still manages 
manages to come up from underneath her radiator. In response, she takes another detour through the scenic countryside until she finds a nice-sized tree to unload him into. Afterward, she smashes him up good several times, but then succumbs to her various concussions. When she comes to, it's snowing outside, and in a Christmas miracle, her vehicle is still drivable. She now assumes this whole ordeal was a dream pursuant to running off the road and hitting a tree, now with a legitimate excuse for being late that covers her original sin of tricking about, she slowly and carefully makes her way out of the woods. When she eventually arrives home, she's surprised to find that her husband's not even there, but she's not left lonely. An old friend hops out and continues to demonstrate his gratitude, this time with a sloppy wet lick on the shoulder. We discover that George is late because he was the man on the scene at the hit and run, and he returns to find that Annie has been granted the gift of escaping both personal and public guilt. Of course, we need to get some closure from young Billy. He cycles hard to keep a lead on his pursuers and finds his way into a little dead end. But it is ultimately revealed that this is his little alcove where he's been cultivating a secret garden of carnivorous plants for some time. As the bullies pay for their wickedness with their lives, he finds himself in rapturous pleasure from witnessing the bloody efficiency of his twisted creations. A little freak, if you think you can handle more, be sure to check out this video next. Now that we're here, I want to congratulate you for making it to the end of the video and affirm that you are a very special person because of it. And if you enjoyed the video, I would love for you to become a part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.